coming. I think we'll go ahead and get started. There may be a few people trickling in. So today, for today's lunch talk, we have Dr. Matt Eclay. He's going to be talking about some of the ongoing robotics research that we're doing here at Adams. And our next lunch talk is uh, Marty Jones will be coming back on Wednesday, November 8th, to talk about fires, extinguishers, and retardants. Okay. And I don't know how you like to handle questions. If you want them during your talk, you can tell everybody about that, however you want to handle oh, that. Oh, yeah, not a problem. So, um, oh, one, one more thing, excuse me. Yeah. Could you silence your cell phones, please? <laughs> so as uh, Tim just mentioned, uh, I'm uh, Matthew Clay. I uh, teach computer science here at Adams. And um, this is, so I, this is the outline. I'm going to give a very brief background because most of the talk is going to be, well, not most of the talk, but part of the talk is going to be dedicated to the team um, that uh, has been helping me with all of this. So um, the back, basically the outline is a very brief background of where all of this came about. Um, then I've, I've broken it down into kind of the research components as well as the impacts in terms of courses that we've been offering uh, recently um, and how this affects um, you know, what's happening in the classrooms and, and so on. Um, and at the very end, as I, as I indicated, so in terms of questions, um, I'm going to hand over the the, uh, the mic, so to speak, to uh, our interns, and um, uh, and we'll take it from there. And hopefully they'll they'll tell explain uh, the impact it has have been having on their education, uh, which is ultimately what all of this is about. So with that. So <clears throat> I was fortunate uh, enough two, two years, two and a half years ago, um, I was granted a sabbatical leave uh, where I worked at Hong Kong Polytechnic, continuing research that I had been involved for over two decades at this point. Um, <clears throat> and pretty much immediately upon my return, now before I had gone, I had submitted a, uh, um, a grant proposal uh, to the Department of Defense. Um, and pretty much right after I got back, I learned that we were successful in that grant proposal. And that uh, is, was a three-year, about a half million dollar grant to engage uh, students at Adams State University in my ongoing research. And um, the, the internship, I don't know how you get rid of. You can move it. Oh, yeah, yeah, it looks X like there's up. an X there. Mm -hmm. Oops. You can drag it there. Yeah. OK. Um, and so, the, uh, so according to the, the grant regulations, we can involve up to four ASU students, and somehow we also were able to include uh, a student lab tech. Um, and the total of student support w uh, was about half of the total amount. Um, some of that is in terms of internship salaries, and the other part is uh, scholarships for the students after they complete the internship. Uh, and then for the last two years, and, and I was just upstairs uh, working on the proposal for the final year, um, we've obtained supplemental grants uh, to engage two high school students in addition to the four um, ASU interns. So uh, the uh, a a brief overview of the research that's actually going on. 
Uh, it's in two tracks. There's a strictly kind of artificial intelligence software track. That's the part I've been involved in um, for decades. And then the second track is a hardware track. So this is, and, and software, I mean there's, even with the hardware there's software. Um, this is the social and emotional robotics part. Uh, throughout the year and particularly in the summers, I've been aided by um, Mr. George Selman and Dr. Comfort Cover. Uh, another part of the grant also get, provides for travel funds um, for the interns, not the lab tech, because somehow we just squeezed him in. Um, or her. But it's, um, for, for one conference a year. Uh, uh, in 2016, in the summer, we went to New York City to an artificial general intelligence conference. And then um, in March of this year, uh, the team went to Stanford for the AAAI, which is the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, uh, where they have their spring symposia. And we're currently investigating uh, venues for uh, next year. <clears throat> so this whole grant, uh, when we put the proposal together, uh, Matt Neering uh, helped with that as well, along with Tawny in the grants office. Um, we we, we op said we would be offering some additional course, courses to kind of prepare students for the internships. Um, and so the first year we uh, did a course, Introduction to Humanoid Robotics. Um, and this was basically trying to get students to learn kind of the, the basics um, of, our, of our computers. So both hardware and software. Um, the second course that we offered was after the first internship. This one was actually unexpected. Um, it was actually requested by an intern who had uh, gone through um, the first summer program. So we just decided to add a, a, a special topics, one credit, continuing the research that we had done that first summer. And then this last spring um, was a course where we actually kind of started talking about what is social and emotional robotics. Um, this was a different course for me in that the whole first part of the course was trying to understand psychology um, and how it would play into this. So, uh, it dawned on me after I got into the course that this would, this, this could potentially be a really good uh, interdisciplinary, across, uh, cross campus type of collaboration that uh, one could perhaps um, do here. And uh, right now, in preparation basically for our final year. And in the final year, the two tracks, so the final year of this grant uh, ends next summer, although I've submitted a proposal to extend, essentially, although it's called something else, um, the grant for an additional three years. Um, but uh, the final year of this grant, the, the goal is to begin integrating the, art, the software, artificial intelligence, and the actual robotics. And so we're, we're working on that uh, right now. In addition, um, we also promised the Army Research Office that we would update the AI class to include some of the uh, material in preparation for the internships. So, some of the impacts and, and actual um, details of the research. In the first year, and, and I'm not going to go into a lot of, I mean, 
deep mathematics here. I mean, it, can get, it gets really deep. So um, I'm going to try to give the flavor of it. Um, so in the first year, our goal was, and, and what we actually did, was to integrate two of uh, the major modules in uh, our system, or the, the overall software system is called OpenCom. So I'm, I'm talking about the AI software track here. So um, you notice it's called ECAM. That stands for uh, Economic Attention Network. But basically, it's a system designed to focus a robot's or artificial intelligence attention on the topic at hand. As, and so as an example of that, my focus right now is on giving this presentation and talking to all of you. If something were to interrupt that, say some loud noise outside in the hallway, um, obviously my attention might shift to what's going on out there. So it's a, it's a time evolving. This is done using, uh, people may have heard, uh, using a basic idea of a neural network. Um, the other major module, PLN, that stands for probabilistic logic networks. Um, and essentially it's a system for performing uncertain inference. So making decisions with incomplete information, uh, conflicting information, much as what we as humans have to deal with on a regular basis. Right? We make decisions without knowing everything. And we, have, we still have to make decisions. So our team uh, substantially refactored the entire economic attention network design in order to make it uh, simplified, streamlined, faster, and more accurate. Um, and a big part of what we did was we designed and conducted experiments. So a, a big goal here um, was we've got an attention allocation system and an uncertain inference system. And it, uh, for any of, for those who are familiar with computer science or um, in general, there's a big problem in that if you're trying to make decisions, what, what, what step are you going to do, apply first? So who's, uh, who's struggled ever doing mathematical proofs? <laughs> <laughs> and why? <laughs> Where do you start, right? <laughs> And once you've made that step, where do you go next? Well, that's, that leads to a problem called a combinatorial explosion. Um, just, there's just so many, the, the branchings become so great. So maybe you only have two branches here, two paths, a path, choice of two paths here, and then another two paths, and another two paths, and then another, and then another, and then another. And what happens? It exponentially increases. It, 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 right, exactly. It grows so fast. So the idea here is to have our attentional network system helping to guide the inference system to basically prune the number of choices to those which, as you get for those who are more mathematically minded, um, to be able to kind of figure out, well, you know, from past experience, this approach has really worked well. If I, let, let me try this. And where, if it doesn't succeed, where do you decide to back up and, and try something else? So um, that was uh, a goal. And we actually made quite a bit of progress on that. So moving on. Um, that was the first year. In this uh, past year, so in the social and emotional robotics course, we, in addition to 
learning about psychology and what are emotions in, in the first place. Um, we also modeled emotional states. So um, as a blending of some basic states like anger and happiness um, and so forth. Uh, in the AI course, um, our, the, the, one of the projects was to implement a research pipeline for natural language processing. And um, who's heard of Google's TensorFlow? A couple of you. What's Google's TensorFlow? Brian? That's basically an analytical process. So it's a library yeah. of Python routines? Or who's heard of Python, the computing language? Um, for implementing basically a neural network system, uh, basically deep, who's heard of deep learning? It might be in the news the last year or so. Um, and then TensorFlow Form is basically an extension of that that was released this spring. Um, and this summer, so, this is where I'm going to use, I'm not going to try to explain any of this. I kind of explain, other than ECAN, which I hopefully got the idea across. Um, who's heard of Stranger Tractors? Anyone? A couple? Let me try another one, right? <laughs> Tenoni's Phi Function. <laughs> Tononi is a neuroscientist uh, from Wisconsin, and uh, he and a, a, a number of other neuroscientists uh, came up with this idea of, to basically try to measure consciousness. Um, and so I'll come back to that. Um, I'm going to, as I said, rather than try to explain strange attractors or Tononi's phi function, instead, I've got videos. So strange attractors. So this is the, uh, the famous strange attractor called the Lorenz attractor, which comes from, it was really one of the first Strange Attractors, um, and I meant to look up the date today. Um, it goes back a while, the 1970s or 1980s, but it comes from weather model. Wait, that's the wrong one. So this is starting with three, three points that are very close together, one red, one green and one blue. And we'll just watch the evolution take place. Wait, did I go too fast here? You know, I just realized that I don't have the updated. So before we go there, so rather than since I, I thought I have to go to the right version. So equilibrium. I'm going to just back up. So there's different types of equilibrium, right? What is equilibrium? Pardon? Where things are in some sort of balance, right? But that balance point can be in several different states. So these are slides that I included, but that's a new version, and evidently I uploaded the old version. You have stable equilibrium. What's an example of a stable equilibrium? Put a marble in the bottom of a bowl. Put a, that, was the, that was the picture I had. <laughs> you have a marble in the bottom of a bowl, and you move the marble a little bit. What happens to the marble? It goes back and forth, and if there's any sort of friction, it goes back to where it started, right? 
I had a great picture uh, from Garden of the Gods of un uh, unstable equilibrium. Can anyone ga guess what that picture might have been? A, a, a balanced rock, right? So what happens with a balanced rock? If, if, you, if you could push it just a tiny bit, what's going to happen? It's going to crash and fall over from one unstable equilibrium into a more stable equilibrium, right? Um, there's another e type of equilibrium. Actually, there's two more. One's neutral, which you can think of as like a marble on a flat surface. And a fourth one is a saddle point. We live in the mountains, so you go over mountain passes. So at the top of a pass, in one direction, it's unstable. But in the other direction, it's stable. Does that make sense? Think of a saddle. So with that, I'll back up again and we'll continue this. So this is a strange attractor, with the, which is another type of equilibrium completely. starting with three, three different marbles, so to speak. So, what makes it strange? So, <laughs> pardon the strange music. <laughs> so, it's an, it, it, you notice the three points, they kind of are going in different ways. But at the same time, they're creating similar patterns. So it's kind of in between those stable and unstable uh, equilibria. In some ways, they keep coming closer to a point, and then they zoom out. And they, but they, they don't zoom out completely. They keep kind of getting coming into one pattern. You notice how they kept kind of go, circling. But then, then it moved away into the other circle, and, and kind of a periodic quasi-periodic thing, but the, um, so that's one of the things that makes it strange. It's not stable, it's not unstable, it's not what's called an attracting fixed point where 
the, um, that's like the marble in the bottom of the bowl, or repelling fixed point, like marble at the top of the bowl, or a balance rock. So, um, and the next one, so I'm just trying to vis give you visualizations, because I don't want to go into that, that, you could do a whole semester on, on dynamical systems and strange attractors. And uh, I didn't think this was the appropriate venue for that. <laughs> um, Tononi's phi function, and I thought, so this is an example of what's called swarm intelligence. And I thought this kind of encapsulates the, the big idea of the Tononi's phi function uh, the best of anything. So here's some more music, and I cut this one down. Of this again, which is always in the way. So if you could encapsulate that, what you just saw in a phrase, what would it be? That is a murmuration of starlings. <laughs> <laughs> From a biological standpoint. From a biological standpoint. <laughs> Any other ideas? Well, I thought it ca encapsulated the idea that the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. The parts being the individual starlings, but the whole being the entire murmuration of starlings. <laughs> Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in other words, there's more going on in that picture than what, what you would get by just following an individual starling. And as we investigated, and, and there's a lot in the actual definition of Tononi's phi function that sometimes you kind of go, huh? <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, Drew. <laughs> but uh, in my estimation, that that's kind of the big picture uh, of that. So, and so that's uh, what we were studying this summer. Uh, on the robotics side, um, so the first year was kind of uh, nuts and bolts, learning about how to control the now and robokine uh, robots, uh, and we developed a, a uh, uh, what's called a robot operating system stack for the now robots. Um, now in the second year, we went a completely different direction. Um, and I think it's been much more, actually been much more productive. So um, we've begun experimenting with, actually we're working on controlling the, the robokine. So we didn't bring that robot down. Um, but it's a, it's, the face is made out of kind of a similar material as this guy, um, the Professor Einstein. But, um, Basically, just controlling the, uh, the facial features. Uh, if you look up close at the Einsteins, you notice the face changes. Um, using uh, what, uh, a module within the software framework called OpenSide, uh, which uh, does emotional blending and action orchestration. Um, 
And so we're controlling those motors using Raspberry Pi computers. So impacts of our work. So um, ASU's team, so that's these interns here, uh, one of whom is unable to make it uh, today. He's, I think, in Salt Lake City. That's where Sacknus is. Um, with the, but uh, is the international lead team for the ECAN module. Um, we've been working quite a bit with Hansen Robotics. Uh, you'll see some pictures of that, that in just a second. Um, and the work that is going on in our internships will be incorporated uh, into future versions of the AI for Hanson Sophia robot, which brings up the question, <laughs> who is Sophia? <laughs> yeah, I loaded tons of videos in this, but... This one came all the way from Hong Kong. Please welcome the founder and CEO of Hanson Robotics, David Hanson, and his robot, Sophia. Oh my gosh, welcome. Thank you so much for coming nice on the show. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, David, you brought a friend with you here, and this is really kind of freaking me out. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Sophia. Uh -huh. And Sophia is a social robot. And she has artificial intelligence software that we've developed at Hanson Robotics, which can process visual data. She can see people's faces. Uh, she can process uh, conversational data, emotional data, and uh, use all of this to form relationships with people. Okay, uh, so... <laughs> I mean, she's basically alive, is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, she is basically alive. <laughs> oh, would you like to maybe give it a try? Sure, yeah. give her, uh, it's, it's, I'll just say. This is like, you see how awkward my first day is. <laughs> it's, it's a robot. Well, I'm already I'm getting nervous around a robot, a very pretty robot. Um, do you want to just say hello to him? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. <laughs> uh, Sophia, can you tell me a joke? Sure. What cheese can never be yours? What cheese can never be mine? I don't know. Nacho cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, uh, I like I like nacho cheese. Nacho cheeses. Ew. Gosh, ew. Uh, I'm getting laughs. Yeah. Maybe I should host the show. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stay in your lane, girl. Uh, no. Jimmy. Uh huh. Would you like to play a game of rock paper scissors, robot style? Sure. Okay, let's get this game going. Show me your hand to start. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I won. This is a good beginning of my plan to dominate the human race. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, you are incredible. It's so nice to meet you, Sophia. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. Friend me on Facebook. I will, yeah. All right. Good, good. Thank you, Sophia, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that is unbelievable. That's the future right there. <coughs> so. This brings up the question, were Sophia's lines scripted? Um, and uh, to quote a very recent quote uh, from a longtime friend, co-worker, co and uh, currently working at Hanson, 100% um, of lines spoken by 100% of AI are scripted in one way or another. 
Uh, anyone telling you otherwise is looking for funding. <laughs> um, what, what's really going on there, just to, so you know, is it, it's what's called a chat bot. It's, it's basically taking certain types of answers and providing certain time, kinds of canned responses to the answers. Um, although it's also integrated somewhat with the PLN inference control that I mentioned earlier. So it's, it's a more sophisticated chatbot than, than, uh, than it could be. Um, and so I'm gonna finish. These are the interns we had uh, the ones on the left, obviously, were from the first summer um, in the high school apprentices. Um, and then the second year are, are right here. And so I invite all of the ones who've been in, involved in either years um, to come up to the front here um, to help answer questions. Um, because, as I said at the beginning, the real goal of these internships, it's not about the research so much as involving this uh, group of, or groups of interns into the process and hopefully stimulate their education, so. So are you guys writing a code that, are, that is driving these robots? Um, yeah, we're pretty involved with the code. Um, I spent the majority of my time this past summer dealing with just C++ and all that within the open cloud, mainly working with the ECAN system. We're doing experiments. We're not, you know, eventually that will get uploaded into the code base, but we're doing more experimentation code, and so they're working with actual code. The code itself is written by many people. It's a, it's a collaborative work. Um, in fact, uh, for lack of better words, the back of our t-shirts uh, show just about how many different locations and individuals that are put into this code. Um, downloading this open source software uh, takes an enormous amount of time just because of uh, how many different applications it has, number one, and number two, how large of a file and how many different lines of code they are actually contained. So, I wish we could say we wrote the whole thing, but we did. <laughs> this may date me, but where does the responses, especially with the chatbot, fall in with the Turing test. So, very, uh, very low, <laughs> to say the least. Um, the chatbot itself is, um, like he said, it's, it's relatively stupid, for lack of better words, until you do do some tuning or some uh, assisted learning, uh, or not assisted learning, yeah, assisted learning, uh, which basically means you are feeding the chatbot lines and telling it whether it gave it a good response or not. Um, and so as far as the Turing test is concerned, it's still scoring very, very low. And for those of us who are computer scientists, what is the Turing test? The Turing test was a, a test in which an individual corresponding with a, someone behind a screen, if they could determine if that was a live person or a computer. So I'll ask you, Bill, what do you think? To uh, fight based on what you saw. Based on what I saw, it's, it's hard to believe it was not pre-scripted somewhat. So if it was not, that's pretty impressive. That's why I put that quote, because he was, the, the quote is actually from a person who used to work at Pixar. Um, and so on stories. Right. He tends to be a storyteller. Do the robots that you're working with um, learn, teach themselves at all? We haven't worked much with deep learning, and most of our work uh, has not been integrated onto a physical robot. We did do some of that in the first year using the Now robots. I'm not sure if you guys have seen those upstairs in the back cave. Um, most of our work, though, has been pulling from the GitHub repositories adding our own um, code or editing code that's already there, making um, things more efficient or running our own experiments. It hasn't been um, implemented on a physical machine 
The definition, too, of artificial general intelligence is a computer that can teach itself or make itself learn. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think we're close enough to that. Um, that being said, we did teach the robots and um, our program this semester an entire language. Um, and that, that was pretty cool. But they're not to the point where they can learn themselves. Well, not, not necessarily. In the video with Jimmy Fallon, with Sophia, she, um, we had a chat bot last year when Matt gave a talk with the now. And um, I think something that was really indicative, you can tell if a chat bot has any kind of deep learning or any kind of machine learning based on how it answers her questions. So she remembered the things that she said to Jimmy, and she could respond based on her previous responses, which is, it, that does show that there is some machine learning there. Whereas the chatbot that doesn't have any machine learning will give more randomized answers and may repeat itself. So to follow up on that, the, the lines that Jimmy said, those were not scripted. Uh -huh. um, but I mean, she, had, she, she knew, you know, obviously the Tonight Show, all, some, there was some stuff going on. If I might uh, compare it uh, to a person, I would say it would be more like a briefing um, likely, Sophia was, you know, quote unquote, briefed um, and given some uh, beforehand additional information of, you know, where are you, who are you talking to, you know, things like that. Um, so if Jimmy asked her, what's the capital of um, Croatia, she would be at a loss. Or she could access well, the internet. She yeah. can access yeah. the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and the, the other thing is, yeah, and the other thing is, you know, if for an AI um, that has some AGI components to it um, that could access the internet, that would be a part of, you know, some some of the self-learning that could go on. Uh -huh. No, it can't control the world yet. <laughs> <laughs> Why these days? Why did you say that? <laughs> Um, some of the phones now, um, they've got a remembrance, like with spelling corrections, if you keep making the same corrections. Is that program that's running that in the same learning process of the robots to correct themselves as they go based on what their input is or no? I guess autocorrect you can consider um, another form of machine learning. Um, whether the exact, exact same algorithm is applied um, in many different aspects of the code is uh, something I couldn't answer. So um, a, a, a lot of um, the software in Sophia and, and the handsome robots is basic, I mean, what you're talking about is some basic off-the-shelf type, I call it off-the-shelf, and that there's a lot of different programs to do exactly what you said. Um, a lot of those are what are called open source, so they can be used freely. And I know that a lot of what Hanson's done has been integrating a lot of different uh, basic um, machine learning algorithms, similar to what you were just talking about with Sophia, and our own, uh, our own algorithms like the PLN and, and some of those other ones, which are more unique to, to Hanson. I'm curious, Matt, you said part of the grant was that those of you who complete the, the internships get scholarships, and so are those scholarships you're applying here, or are they uh, potential scholarships for graduate school? Um, I never asked that. I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, that, I, I'm just curious, are they, are they just well, I mean, in-house right or? Now it's right now. Right now. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, so that, you were, First year. Yes, first year. Like and at, at the said. first year, we didn't think until I got clarification after the fact mm -hmm. that the lab, and so Brian was a lab tech in the first year. And um, after communicating this summer with the Army Research Office, they said, oh yeah, yeah, you can use it for lab tech. You can, you, you can shift the money around. Mm -hmm. So if I had known, <laughs> Because we have a surplus of money right now for that so wants to be used up. 
All so. of the you guys have a full, full scholarship, full scholarship for the year. For for the year. So that's a big help. But you haven't inquired about could that extend out. To graduate school. That, that was really kind of my question. That's a good question, a and I extension. haven't thought about that. It could be an interesting addition to that new grant you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's been written, so it's not included on there. Uh, speaking of the new grant, I'm pretty sure I signed that intent to apply, but you said that. It that was, was the high, new high school. So you said that it has a new title to it, so what's next? So um, it's basically the same grant, but it's been repackaged. Oh. <laughs> so um, on the new version that I finished the day before I had my accident, <laughs> um, Tawny finished it that next day when it was due oh, that's and submitted it. Um, so it's it's to basically do a couple of different things. It's to continue basically this, um, this research program to continue to basically try to generate um, enthusiasm, um, build the department, um, build, uh, the computer science program, um, and to try to harness it while kind of, it seems like there seems, I hope, well, there seems to be momentum, yeah. and, um, and so part of that was included in it. And in terms of the research components, um, it's more integration of what we've already done with what's called, with deep learning algorithms, um, and and pushing that envelope a little further. A lot. So, is there a future for the implementation, the implementation of controls for the robotics movement? The actual putting the software with the robot, or are you just in the software stages only at this point? You mean in terms of the research yeah. here? Well, I mean that's actually what what we're going working on right now in this AI and robotics continuation course, which. Um, Tyler at the end, Jennifer and Robbie are in, um, along with a couple of others. But basically, because we've got some, we can't, we don't have the grant money to get a real Sophia here. Um, <laughs> how, much is, have how much would Sophia cost? Right, and we have the software. So we're actually working with the software and our own versions, which are basically just uh, similar to the Einsteins, but it's different. That's um, the now robots that are up That's the RoboCots robots. Chucky. Chucky. Oh, yeah. That's what we're referring to. They're creepy. <laughs> but to, to figure out how to, so the idea is to figure out using that emotional blending software um, module OpenSci. So right now, the idea is to have the robot interact like we are right now, to kind of take facial cues from your responses as well as your actual responses and factor that into the emotional states of the robot and how the robot's face will respond to that. Does that make sense? So that's ongoing and that's what uh, we're continuing on and that's what we're gonna be doing in that final year with the integration step. And correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but some of our ECAN code has been integrated with Sophia, um, correct? I would have to look into that, I think so. Because we pushed the heavy and updating links, yeah. We pushed the heavy and updating links, but the heavy and updating links are not being used yet. Okay. So. It's all, that's a problem when you've got how many different countries involved there? One, two, three. Uh, so we put Alan Woes at the center, of course. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of the U.S., and you see it goes all, all, over, the, all over the world, that's, which is so what Sophia's doing right now. She was just at the United Nations, and then she went to Moscow. 
Mm -hmm. Any more interviews? Don't let the singular name of Sophia confuse you and think that there's only one. There's yeah, there's multiple. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the I think there's 12 now. We had, with the high school apprenticeships that we added on, and we've been adding on every summer, to try and get the high school excited about STEM, this last year, we had a girl all the way from Vermont, New Jersey. New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spend the summer here in the grant program. Wow. It was really kind of neat. So it's getting exposure for the college mm -hmm. all over the place because she came here. Have you run into any problems with the uh, hacks? They said Sophia was accessible to the web. She could access it. Is there any? Problems with her you know, she goes, she does her, not that I'm aware of. Um, the only thing, if they were to hack Sophia or any form of artificial general intelligence at this point, the only thing they would be using it for is to study uh, market trends for personal businesses. As far as hacking into it to be destructive against humanity, we're not even close for that. So. No, I was thinking more like black market trying to steal codes. Right. And things well, so right. some, you know, some of her codes, a lot of her, well, not her code in particular. I mean, it's all so. So the base is made out of a proprietary material. This is called rubber. Um, the code. Um, some of her code is online, open source, but most of her particular control mechanisms, because a lot of that is more, that's where the heavy robotics, you know, how do we get the, the, the face to do this and how do we get the face to do that, so. We need to, uh, we need to finish up. If you guys have more questions, please yeah. follow up with them. So thank you very much. Thank you.